Amen. Your life doesn't consist in the abundance of your possessions. The, the bumper sticker is, is funny because it counters so much of what is true, that the one who dies with the most toys wins. It's humorous to see it on the back of a, a car, but, but we know this isn't true. Your life doesn't consist of, it's not measured by, it's not made by the abundance of, of your possessions, the amount of things or the quality or value of the things that you have. So goes Jesus' warning for us in his word. But why does Jesus give such a warning? Is it because Jesus doesn't want you to be happy, doesn't want you to win the lottery of one point whatever billion, doesn't want you to have lots of things and lots of possessions? He would rather have you suffer He'd rather have you struggle and be without bodily comforts than to have plenty, to have lots of comforting things around you. Is Jesus saying that abundance is evil, is bad? That might fit with what is somewhat the spirit of our age. It views people that have a lot of stuff and and because there's envy involved, looks at them and says, well, they're evil because they have more than somebody else does. Well, and really it's because they have more than me. (laughs) Somebody's abundance, that has to be an evil thing, a bad thing. And and those people who have more, they're the evil ones. The people like, like, uh, like us, the people like us that struggle and don't have as much, we are the good ones. So this is Jesus calling abundance evil. Well, no, we know that's not true. Though Jesus clearly shows a, a compassion and a love and a tender care that he, that he takes with those who are physically poor, those that, that struggle to get by, he provides with miracles and with blessings and he encourages his people to do the same, to take from the, the abundant blessings that we have to care for others. Jesus obviously wants wants to show love to those who are poor, but but Jesus doesn't call abundance evil. Jesus would have us confess with Job. No, the Lord gives and the Lord has taken away. Job, after he had lost his magnificent wealth, the Lord gives, the Lord has taken away. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart from this world on my last day. No, all these things that I had, that I have or will have in the future, they all come from the hand of my gracious God. That's what we confess. We, we did that last Sunday when we confessed or when we studied and prayed the words of the fourth petition of the, the Lord's Prayer. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Give us everything that we need for body and life for today. And he does, and he has, and he will again and again, day after day. We confess in Luther's explanation to the, second, or the first article of the creed. What do, what do we say? You can remember this. He richly and daily provides clothing, shoes, house, home, wife, children, spouse, children, land, cattle, all that I own, all that I need to keep my body, in, oh, all of those things. Our God provides. And, and it would be a criminal understatement for us to say that, it's, that he only provides as much as we need. He is abundant with his blessings. He's lavish with the way that he pours out so much more than we need for body and life, so much more than we need for today. All of it is an abundant blessing and a gift from his hand that we can be thankful for. So why the warning against looking at the abundance? Why does Jesus warn us Your life does not consist of, it's not found in or or measured by this abundance of your possessions. So be on guard against greed in all of its forms. I think it's because of the other spirit of our age and it's really a spirit of every age because it's ingrained in our sinful nature to be envious of those who have more than we do. To, to look at the things that we have and not see them as the abundance that they really are, but, but to see them as a shortfall. 
to look at what comes from our, our Heavenly Father's hand for us and to say, well, that's not in abundance. That's actually, that's actually insufficient. You know how we're tempted to, to do this thing where we say, oh, well, I don't have enough. I seem never to have enough. It doesn't matter what, what we view that enough as being enough to do whatever. No, it's, I don't have enough. I never seem to have, or, or if I'm really going to be honest, I'll say, I have enough, but it's only barely enough, only just, just enough. What I have, it can't be called an abundance. It's merely enough. Well, you might recognize that kind of attitude if you if you think about it this way, have you ever looked at someone who drives a car that isn't as nice as yours or lives in a home or a neighborhood that, that you view as not as nice as yours and, and, and has a, a, a job that doesn't pay them as much as you know your job pays you? And you look at them and you think, oh, too bad for him, too bad for her, too bad for them. You pity them because they have less than you. And and in our hearts, we think, well, what a nice thing it is for me to pity someone who has less than me. Isn't that what Jesus would have me do? And for a moment, I want you to understand that pity isn't admirable. That pity really isn't compassion. It's arrogant greed. If you're looking at someone and you think to yourself, they have less than I do, I barely have enough. If I had only as much as he has or as much as she has, well then something would obviously be wrong. God would not be fulfilling his promise. Especially if we're looking at someone that delights in God's blessings to them and we look at them and say, but they don't have as much as I do. Oh, pity them. That's not compassion and it's not admirable. It's telling God, if you give me one cent less, one thing less, you're doing wrong. And so Jesus sounds this warning. Your life doesn't consist in the abundance of your possessions. Don't measure your life by the amount of the things or the value of the things. In fact, be careful how you view those things. Jesus sounds this warning to show the danger of having our eyes focused on the gift and not on the giver. To be obsessed with the abundance and to forget about the source of those abundant blessings. The thought that always comes to my mind, and I've shared it before and I'll share it again, the thought that always comes to my mind when Jesus tells this parable is that of of. of the great big pile of gifts under the Christmas tree and what delight we have to see, especially young children, opening, tearing into those gifts and the, the wild joy in their eyes as they're doing this and we love to see it and we pray, at least in the back of our minds I pray, but Lord, let not the joy of this day and the joy of this experience fade away when the last gift is opened. Let it not happen that that the joy comes from the opening, from the getting, from the having, and there always being more, and there being some kind of disappointment when the opening is done, when the gifts are all there. How sad is it? Well, not just when the gifts are loved more than the giver, but if there ever comes a time when the giver is despised because he hasn't given enough when the giver goes away completely unthanked. Jesus sounds the warning for us to be on guard against this. Be on guard. And the Apostle Paul picks up this warning and he carries it to our ears, not because he just wants to beat it into our heads that you do bad, stay away from bad things. He loves us too much to let us get wrapped up in our love of things. The Apostle Paul says it so beautifully. The, the love of this stuff is the root of all kinds of evil. It gives birth to all kinds of pain. He says many people have so loved these things, so been consumed with it, he says, 
People eager for these things have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. They've, they've caused themselves so much pain and they've given up their faith in Christ because they have set their hearts on this stuff and measuring their life and their joy in this life by how much and how many are the blessings. So Jesus' warning to us isn't against wealth and blessings. It's against the love of them. His warning and and his fear for us is against an unquenchable desire for those things. It's not a condemnation of success and money. Work hard. Receive the, the, the due wage that you are, are to be given. Be, be rightly, have a godly pride of, of the blessings that he gives you the strength or wisdom to achieve. Be thankful for those things. But this isn't a condemnation of those things. It's a warning against trusting in them. It's a warning against putting our hope in them and making them and those things and the amount of those things what our life is all about. And so God clearly says in his words, you shall have no other gods. Not just because he's got this obsession and jealousy over our attention, but because he knows if you go get yourself a different God, that God is going to let you down and you're going to die. You go make yourself a God of this stuff and it's not going to be there to save you. It might give you some, some earthly comfort and feel like you're safe, but on the last day, you'll be left holding the bag and it will disappear in your hands. Your wealth, your possessions, these things are not going to forgive your sin. They're not going to deliver you from death. They are not going to promise you anything for eternity. You make yourself a God of any of these things and they will all disappoint you. That's what the apostle, that's what King Solomon would be saying. That's the meaninglessness of chasing after the wind and the things in this life doesn't mean we despise those things, but do not let them become what we put our hope and our trust in. Do not let it become what your life consists of. So what a God we have. How much does your Savior love you and me that he gives us this stern warning and he puts fire behind it? You fool, he says, to the one who trusts in this stuff and makes it his God. What a loving Savior we have to warn us with such a terrible warning, and yet at the same time, he doesn't withhold those blessings, those gifts, and that abundance. Maybe you thought that was, that was the answer to the Christmas problem. Maybe that's what, what we think, you know, if, if the kids are going to become in love with the gifts rather than the giver, maybe we just shouldn't give the kids any gifts. That would solve the problem, right? But no. And that isn't the way our Savior solves the problem. He doesn't withhold those gifts. He gives them in abundance and he, he would have us be taught and teach our children and encourage one another to receive every one of those gifts, whether they are, are big or small, whether they are many or whether they are few, to receive every single one of them with hearts of thankfulness that see every single one of those, those gifts, those blessings as an expression of his love and care and providence for us. All of it comes from your hand. That's the way the Bible speaks of that, right? Because every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of the heavenly lights. Jesus says, make your life about. Seek first all the stuff that God has for you. His kingdom and his righteousness, his word and his promise. Seek these things first and all the other stuff is going to come as well. All of your needs are going to be taken care of in abundance. Your head will be crowned with blessings. Like King David says in Psalm 23, you know, you anoint my head with oil. The cup of the blessings that you give me, it just overflows all of the time. Jesus promises us these things and, and encourages us toward it. And the Apostle Paul picks up on that too. So, so if God the Father did not withhold from you the greatest gift, the most abundant gift, the most valuable gift of all, if he didn't withhold his own son but gave him up for you, how is he not also going to take care of all the things, 
all of the problems, all of the needs, every bill, every one of our needs of body and soul. How is he not also going to graciously provide all of it? Abundantly provide all of it. So as individuals, as families, as a congregation of believers, we, we have great reason to take a look at our God's great love for us. You are rich. Your fields have produced an abundant crop. So thank God for that. Thank God for all of his blessings. Rejoice for what he has given you. If the preaching of the law today has, has led you to see, as, as I have seen in my own heart, that my heart can be greedy and unthankful, sometimes repent of your sin. Plead for his mercy. And then recognize what he's done. He sees your need, both of body and soul. And he continues to give. He has given you a savior. Moved heaven and earth to provide for you one who will pay the debt of your guilt and your sin and your thankless heart <laughs> and your greedy, sinful nature. He has sent his son to pay for your guilt and sin with his blood. And he blesses you with forgiveness and with life. Abundant life. Not just comfort and abundance here, but a life that's never going to end in eternity with him. Your life does not consist in the abundance of earthly possessions. It consists of, it, it is made up of the abundant love and promises that have been lavished on you by God's own Son. May Jesus always lead us to be thankful for this, to have this view of our earthly blessings. In his name, amen.